Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to my IVF Fences and welcome to our webinar session tonight. I'm glad to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining us already. As you can see, our special guest and speaker is with us today as well. Dr. Angela Inesa is with us. Hello. Dr. Inesa, welcome back. Great to have you back. This is your second webinar with us and uh, it was wonderful to hear that you enjoyed the first one. I'm sure it's going to go great today as well. How are you feeling? I know it's really hot in Madrid, but I hope you're doing okay and are ready to educate us a bit. I'm ready. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And uh, well, let's uh, share some interesting information on the topic. Brilliant. And today we will talk about PGTA indications, prospects explained. And of course, Dr. Yanessa will start with her presentation. Dr. Angela Yanessa, she's the fertility specialist at Clinica Tambra. As I've already mentioned, she's located in Madrid. And today she has prepared a presentation on PGTA. So if there are any questions you have on this particular topic, you can type those in the chat because we will definitely take care of those uh, right after the presentation. Remember, uh, you can put those in the chat. Uh, Dr. Yanessa will uh, try to answer all of them. Uh, so don't hesitate. As you know, we are here to educate, to inform you, to help you with any questions that you might have. And we've been here uh, for a few years already. So I'm glad to see that it's still working. It's still uh, helping. And I'm glad that you were able to join us. And I think that we can go ahead with our webinar. Dr. Yanessa, thank you so much already for joining us today. And are you ready to start our presentation? Definitely. Thank you for the marvelous introduction you've just done. Thank you so much indeed. And let's go ahead. Let's do it. Well, as most of you do know already, today we're going to go through the pre-implantation and genetic testing, which is also shortened to PGT, okay? Normally PGTA, because it's the, the one that we do most often. The topic is going to be addressed in the following way. We will, be, we will define what's the PGT. We're going to define when we use it, its indications, how it is done, its phases, we're going to see a little bit more, understand more about the laboratory process, and we're going to understand what different results can come out after doing the testing, okay? So let's start with the definition. Preimplantational genetic testing is a procedure that allows us to study the genetic composition of the embryos before an embryo transfer, okay? Normally, the embryos are going to be frozen before the embryo transfer in order to be able to have the time to get a diagnosis. Depending on the type of genetic testing that, that we do, and you will understand further on the different tests we can do, we'll be able to um, chromosomally or genetically study the embryo and get a result, okay? Normally, it is done by taking out some cells, as you can see here, from the trophectoderm, which are the cells that will be become uh, will become after the placenta. Hence, the embryo itself it's not touched. Okay, this is very important because some people might be a little bit afraid of damaging the embryo, etc. We know that the technique is sure, is safe. Okay, and if you want to be further reassured, just remember that we are not touching the embryo. We are taking five, six cells of the ones that are meant to become the placenta after. As uh, we, you maybe know already, okay, in order to do a PGTA testing, a PGT testing, we need to undergo an IVF treatment, meaning ovarian stimulation, egg retrieval, egg fertilization, okay. In order to do the genetic testing, we need to do an ICSI, a conventional IVF fertilization me method uh, is uh, discouraged because it could lead to confusion in the final chromosomes and genetics of the, of the embryo. So anixi is advised, okay? And uh, the advantages of the technique is first finding a healthy embryo. Normally that healthy embryo is going to be uh, called euploid, chromosomally normal, okay? But also this technique allows us to find embryos free of some genetic conditions, normally monogenic diseases. 
the most uh, known one is cystic fibrosis, but there are hundreds or hundreds of diseases that could eventually be studied, okay? And we could find healthy embryos uh, not affected by the disease, okay? As I was saying before, uh, depending on the type of result we are looking for, there are three types of uh, PET. Uh, this uh, final name was uh, agreed a few years ago by, by the European Fertility Society, okay? So if we're going to study the chromosomes of the embryo, we're going to do a PET A, A for aneuploids, okay? If we're going to study embryos with a balanced chromosome composition, okay, coming from parents from whom we know that are carriers of a balanced translocation, we're going to do a PTSR, okay? And if we are going to look for monogenic diseases, once again, the most well-known one is cystic fibrosis, okay? We're going to do a PTM. M stands for monogenic, okay? As we have already said, the main indication for PET uh, are either to confirm that the embryo has a normal karyotype or to uh, find free of disease carriers or non-carriers and rule out uh, sick embryos, okay, embryos affected by a, a certain monogenic condition, okay. Um, those would be the main medical indications that we have nowadays, okay. There's another one which is also is uh, regularly used but can be a bit uh, uh, controversial sometimes but remains the main indication nowadays which is advanced maternal age. What is it that we call advanced maternal age? Normally that should be after 38 years uh, old, okay? After that moment, considering that the prob probabilities of having an aneuploid chromosomally abnormal embryo are going to be increased, okay? We can use the PGTA to find out healthy embryos, embryos with a normal male or female karyotype, and therefore uh, increase the success rate by decreasing the miscarriage rate, because we know that chromosomally normal embryos have a miscarriage rate which is lower than 10%. And what is being what is being what it is being studied right now is to see whether by doing the PTA testing, considering uh, advanced maternal age, okay, we can make treatments more efficient by avoiding doing transfers that embryo transfers that otherwise would have been avoided, okay, transferring unhealthy embryos that will not turn into an ongoing pregnancy. Normally, they won't even implant, okay, but if they were to implant, they would have a higher miscarriage rate. Why is age so important? We are always talking about women's age, unfortunately. Um, nowadays, there's more uh, new, new research uh, going on regarding paternal age, but uh, still the main prognostic factor for the type of treatments that we do uh, remains uh, maternal age or all side age, I would say. And it's very important because as you know, uh, still nowadays the, 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 the nature works in the same way that it, it has been working uh, ever since forever. And uh, let's say that the good all sides normally are selected between 25 and 35 years of age meaning that the oocytes that remain for later times after 35 and especially after 40 are less likely to produce a healthy embryo because, well, they would have been there at least for 39, 39 40 years uh, and they can, they can have trouble in the engine, the mitochondria, etc., and all the engine that is going to be crucial later on to divide the chromosomes, okay? So if we have problems there, it is more likely to have embryos that might have extra or less chromosomes than what should be, okay? And you can see some, some graphics there that are going to illustrate actually what we're saying. As the maternal age goes 
gets higher, okay, we're going to see an increase in the nucleoid rate. We're going to see an increase in the miscarriage rate because abnormal embryos are the main cause of miscarriage, okay, and we're going to see a decrease in the live birth rate, okay. If we were able to do a genetic testing on the embryos, okay, the pregnancy rate would, meet, would remain the same. This is an old research, okay, telling us that it doesn't matter how old the oocytes are as long as we are able to produce a chromosomally normal embryo. Um, however, I must say that there, there are some recent publications that might argue that, that it is not the same to have a normal embryo for uh, oocytes of 44 years of age, that embryos of 37 years of age or 30 years of age, okay? But what is more, most agreed on nowadays is that as long as we have a chromosomally normal embryo, the pregnancy expectations are going to be the same regardless of the age. And those pregnancy expectations would be between 50 and 70%. This is how we do it, okay? This is a blastocyst in which the, the biopsy is being done. We're going to take a deeper look at that now, okay? So actually, this is the lab procedure. We have our blastocyst here, the inner layer cells. As I said before, this is the embryo. This is the trophoctoderm, the cells that will become the placenta after. As you can see, there's a hole here because it, normally in order to do the, the PTA testing to uh, make it easier for the embryo to get outside the, the eggshell. We're going to say that that covers it. On day three, our colleagues from the lab do what we call an assisted hatching, okay, in order to easen the hatching procedure of the embryo, okay. So there's a hole from which the embryo is extruding the cells, okay. It's a very a fully hatched embryo, okay. The embryo is hole with a holding pipette and they are going to take out just uh, three, six cells, okay? We only need those, those many, considering that the embryo has around 200, 300 uh, cells at that stage. We're going to take three to five cells. There's a lot of discussion nowadays to see what technique to remove the cells could be better because there are different techniques. It's amazing what they do in the lab, okay? And after they, they've gotten those cells, they're going to put them back in a, in a pipette, okay? And they're going to send them to the genetics lab, okay? Where the sample will be processed, okay? It is a very accurate and extensive genetic testing that we're going to do. Uh, nowadays, the technique uh, that is on is uh, NGS, Next Generation Sequencing, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of time to get the result, normally between two to th three weeks. That's the reason for which the embryos are frozen after doing the biopsy in order to have time to get back the result. Um, it is still possible to get 24 hour, hours uh, results by doing a different technique, which is called an array, but it is not advised. We do not need to rush. Nowadays, we have NGS, which is very accurate, and it is better to wait in order to do that, the NGS instead of uh, getting an immediate result, okay? Oh, I, I have just answered that question. <laughs> Once we get the we get the result, there are going to be um, two or three possible diagnoses. Okay, uh, depending on the perspective, we can we will see two or three. Here we have three options. Okay, either the embryo is euploid, chromosomally normal, containing twenty three pairs of chromosomes, male or female. Either the embryo is a nuploid. Okay which can have gains or losses of uh, chromosomes, okay? And there's a gray zone, which is, uh, or which are mosaic embryos, okay? Mosaic embryos are uh, embryos that contain two different cell lines, as you can, you can see here. Um, one of them could be euploid, normal, okay? And the other one could be a euploid, okay? Um, that's the perspective from the, this is, these are the options from the diagnostic perspective, okay? Um, there's a lot of controversy right now going on with mosaic embryos. And there are some places when, where they do not even, uh, 
give the diagnosis, they just classify your embryos as transferable or not transferable, not suitable for transfer, okay? Uh, we like to give you a diagnosis, okay? We like to tell you what is going on, what's the diagnosis of your embryo, okay? Euploid embryos could be transferred without any kind of advice because we know they are normal. And euploid embryos are not transferred, okay? Because we cannot transfer embryos that might lead to a, health, a, a sick uh, embryo, okay? And we cannot do things that are, are not uh, meant to, to turn into an ongoing pregnancy. And mosaic embryos, depending on the chromosomes involved, depending on the percentage of uh, a nuploidy, after a genetic counseling could be transferred, okay? But they are not immediately, uh, they are not easily used, okay? In the sense that we need, uh, we need a genetic advice. And normally some kind, some form of, um, Genetic diagnostic, if there's a pregnancy, is advised. And well, that was it, okay, regarding the, the PGT. I hope uh, you've, underst you've understood everything and that everything is clear for you and you have a deeper view of the technique. And if you want to, we can go straight, jump straight into the questions, which is always the, the most interesting and the most uh, didactic part. Okay, so let's get to that. Thank you so much, Clarissa, for your presentation and explaining how it works. Uh, and thank you for adding the information about mosaic embers. This is a question that we usually get quite a lot. This is, as you said, controversial topic. Uh, and of course, right now it's time uh, for your questions. You already answered the first one. Uh, so Joseph would like to thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned this during your uh, presentation, right? So we can move on to the um, next question. And I see that someone is typing, so I'm sure there will be some more. This is the question. I will show you the second one from Joseph. Okay, just give me a second. Yes, so interesting debates ongoing on the mosaics. True, do you have any positive outcome with those? Um, I do. I have a positive outcome with mosaics. I think what we should uh, rejoice on is uh, not having unpleasant uh, outcomes with mosaic embryos. Um, so far, what we know is with mosaic embryos, they have a lower implantation rate. Always we are talking about mosaic embryos that are suitable for transfer according to the, the, the PGDs, the genetic preimplantational, the interna international preimplantational Diagnos diagnostic society. Okay, but we know that there are some some embryos, some mosaic embryos that uh, whose transfer is not advised. For example, those in which uh, chromosome twenty one is involved. Okay, but in those that uh, in, in those whose uh, transfer is advised, um, there is a lower, there would be a lower implantation rate, okay, which could be between 50 and 30%, depending on the type of chromosomes, number of chromosomes involved, and percentage, and a higher miscarriage rate if eventually the, the nuploid line was a true one, okay. So in my experience, either uh, they do not implant, Either they turn into an ongoing pregnancy in which uh, some form of genetic uh, prenatal diagnosis is advised. Okay, mm -hmm. I so far I cannot remember of uh, miscarriages specifically in mosaic embryos, but I do have uh, quite a few pregnancies derived from mosaic embryos. Okay, thank you. And there's a follow-up polar body biopsy. Polar body biopsy that doesn't belong to to this time of age, uh, so we we don't do it. It's an old thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for your questions, and thank you for helping with those. And let's have a look. Uh, we have another one from Lisa. I have had eight embryos transferred during using donor egg with no implantation. Any of them, I have had extensive testing, and the next recommendation is either PGTA embryo of donor sperm, would it be recommended to test the embryos with both donor eggs and donor sperm? Thank you. Um, so far, the, the agreement is that uh, ideally, uh, PET 
A, because here we would be, we would be doing uh, a new blood testing on the embryos, uh, is not advised when we are using donor eggs, because as we've seen, the main indication is advanced maternal age, over 38, and uh, egg donors on average have between 20 and 25. So um, what we know is that it isn't generally advised, but it's something that we use sometimes because it might shorten the time to pregnancy. When you've had uh, a embryos transferred um, without even a positive pregnancy test, we want to gain as much insight as in po possible in what's going on. Uh, seems about right trying to use donor sperm and seems about right doing the PTA testing on the embryos because at least we are, not, we are going to know that the embryos are chromosomally normal. And by knowing that, we can maybe focus on some other factors implied in the implantation. Okay, thank you so much for that, Lisa. I hope that helped as well. Um, thank you indeed, and let's have a look, okay? Uh, first, Joseph would like to say thanks for, for, previous, for answering previous question. And Fran has a question for you as well. So why isn't PGT testing offered recommended for all women plus 35. Because uh, overall, right now, what we know is that PTA is not going to improve the success rate overall. It might improve the success rate per embryo transfer, but the overall, the cumulative life birth rate could be the same. So when we do things from a medical perspective, if we want to do it populationally based, uh, we need to look at the first at the, uh, the the utility of the technique we are doing. Is it use is is it useful right now to improve the success rate per embryo transfer? Probably we're going to say yes, but there's a lot of research going on there. Okay, and um, then depends on the perspective we see it from. Also depends on the center in which you are doing it. So medically, it isn't indicated, but it's something you, we can, on an individual basis, discuss with your doctor. Always when we're working in the private sector, um, until we, do, we don't have evidence telling us that PTA is going to make the treatment more efficient, it won't be even discussed doing it, populationally speaking, or in... Um, in, in when we're doing treatments in a, a funded public funded uh, treatment. Okay, thank you once again, Lisa. From our previous uh, question, thanks a lot. Lots makes a lot of sense. Thank you for response uh, from Joseph. Ex next question: The UK are in favor of single embryo transfer. As Joyce Harper of the UCL recently, if they do PGTA routinely on all patients. Is that what ob obtains at your center? I don't understand what's the question. I think that it's, is it something that you also agree with when it comes to the UK are in favor of single embryo transfer, but if I'm not correct, Joseph, if you can tell us, uh, let us know. Yeah, this... sing yeah, single embryo transfer is a, is the main approach and the ideal approach we want happy families, and we know twin pregnancies have a, a high risk for many obstetrical complications. So that's not the first approach, transferring to embryos. Less if we are transferring a, an embryo tested, because we know that we are removing the main factor for failure, the, the alterations in the, the chromosome status of the embryo. So it is necessary to transfer two embryos at a time to have a pretty good success rate. Okay, let us know if that answers your question. I believe yes, so, but of course, uh, let us uh, let us know. And let's uh, have a look. Raquel has another one. So from your experience, on average, what percentage of tested embryos return as non-transferable? Uh, to say how many embryos on average does a woman need to test for her to have one transferable embryo on average, right? Um, that depends on the, the age of the oocyte. Is where if we're working with oocytes above 43, the the euploidy uh, rate that is expected is less than 10 percent. If we're working with uh, 36 uh, years of age oocytes, 
the employee rate can be around 50, 60 percent. So the main factor when we are going to do this treatment and in order to know our chances of having a chromosomally normal embryo, always working with normal karyotypes, is the oocyte age. Okay. However, this is statistics and statistics are populational. We know because there are research that tell us that what will happen to an individual, it is very difficult to tell and it can change from time to time. We know that a patient who's 43 is less likely to have a nucleoid embryo, but it isn't impossible. And maybe she just gets one embryo, one blastocyst that is tested and the result comes back and the embryo is chromosomally normal. Okay, that would be a 50, 50 percent um, uh, odds of having a nucleoid embryo. Whereas we can have, uh, on the contrary, a uh, 36 uh, uh, years old woman in which we get to test three blastocysts. All of them come abnormal, okay? Uh, we are very saddened with the result. However, we know that if we do a new cycle, we have chances of having a nuploid, a healthy embryo, okay? So uh, statistics are useful to give uh, ideas and to give prognosis but they cannot tell us exactly what is going to happen at that time. Okay, again, brilliant. Thank you so much for that. And let's have a look, okay? Next question also from uh, Joseph. So two parts of this. So in my center, we sometimes employ PGT as a tool for determining the gender as either XY or XX. Is this also one of the indications so you, since you didn't include that? Uh, sexing of the embryos is uh, forbidden in, in Spain. In my personal opinion, I'm glad it is forbidden. Understood, of course. Thank you so much for the clarification to this question. And let's have a look. We need to wait. I don't see any more questions at this point. I'm sure you have some. Uh, of course, Joseph would like to say, okay, understood. Thank you. And of course... There are more thank yous uh, from our previous patients for you. As you can see, Raquel would also like to say thanks. And I'm waiting because, of course, there's another question. Sorry, right here. Can we assume that in five blastocyst transfers, blastocyst transfers, three of them were euploid, or is this, or is it impossible to say? H33 karyotype is okay. It is impossible to say. But I say that it is pretty unlikely that in five blastocysts, none of them uh, was chromosomally normal, at least one. However, um, I had uh, results in, with normal karyotype, 34 years of age, in which we get to, tell, to test 10 blastocysts, and all of them came back abnormal. So we never, we never know. But what you would expect would be that at least one would be chromosomally normal, but without testing, we can never know. Okay. Crystal clear, I believe as well, again. So thank you so much indeed. Um, let's give it a minute again. Sorry, we need to wait for yet another question. Yeah, so maybe it's going to be a longer question. <laughs> so. Let's Hopefully, I will be able to answer it. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure <laughs> it's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's necessary. <laughs> yes, but uh, yeah, the thing with PGT is that we are working with odds. Um, but it's fascinating huh? because we there there are some pretty interesting research published in, with, in which we do the genetic testing, no embryos are transferable, we repeat same protocol, same patients, everything in the same procedure, and we have one, two chromosomally normal embryos. So obviously, um, if we wanted to have those specific um, percentage that, that are expected according to age, we would need to have hundreds of embryos if that's something that isn't feasible. Okay, mm -hmm. so question... Yeah. Yes, of course, more, more questions. So the problem without, without testing is if mo multiple good blastocysts, the woman could transfer many non-viable before randomly choosing the euploid. Yeah, so an expensive lottery. Thank you, Fran. 
I, I agree. I, I agree with you, Fran, but um, sometimes just incurring on the, on the testing at the beginning might be more expensive and yet unnecessary. So when it comes to money, financial decisions, we need to give you the, all the medical advice. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you, you, you need to consider everything and give it a thought. But actually, as I said, there are research uh, going on there. The problem is that the financial issues are all, not always that, that clear to, to, to have accurate data to, mm -hmm. to advise you with. Of course. Okay. Thank you. How about this? So what is your opinion on day seven PGT, a tested normal embryo? Well, um, it's a controversial issue because uh, I think that's more of an embryologist uh, issue <laughs> because uh, if the embryo is normal, we are going to transfer it and depending on, on the, the, the status of the embryos, the embryo, it's, um, it's classification, no? We're going to synchronize the, the endometrium with the with the embryo, but it, it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning. As long as we have a chromosomically normal embryo, the pregnancy expectations should be the same. From an embryologist's point of view, as they always tell me, they prefer blastocysts coming, blastocysts are formed on day five, early day, day six. Embryos that take longer might have some kind of uh, different issues that even if they're chromosomally, chromosomally normal, might prevent them from turning into an ongoing pregnancy. But I believe there's an ongoing, there are some ongoing research uh, really into this topic. So hopefully we'll have a, cl a clear view in mm -hmm. the next uh, months or years. Okay. Still something we need to wait a bit. Okay. Let's, let's give it a second again. I know that someone was typing and is typing, so I'm sure there will be some more questions coming up. Uh, so we need to... Very interesting it. question. Thank you guys for your questions. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely an interesting session. And um, thank you for those. Okay. Um, sorry, Fran has something else to add. So, okay, but as testing was not to be brought up by my family's experience, UK clinics, and that seems quite the norm. Any comments on that? Yeah, because in the UK, um, I, I think they're becoming stricter following the HFEA criteria with the red lights, etc. Yes. And the PDA mm -hmm. testing doesn't have a green light. So come to a different clinic where they have uh, less uh, restrictive uh, restrictive regulation, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely different in, in the UK. Yeah, yeah if you the, go to... They become more uh, strict on the on the add-ons and PTA could be considered uh, an add-on on the treatment. So, well, normally they, they don't do it. Then mm -hmm. also that depends on the, the lab they have because uh, PTA is costly, is time consuming in the lab. So some centers do not even offer it because at the end of the day, it isn't worth it for them financially wise. So mm -hmm. many okay. factors behind that. Thank you for adding this as well. Um, if there's anything else you would like to add, of course, this is your time. And if not, remember that they can always get in touch with Dr. Yanissa and her team at Clinica Tambre. And I'm sure they will be more than happy to, to answer any of your questions. In the meantime, we did receive one more. So can I have an idea of the cost at your center? Can you accept transported trophectoderm, trophectoderm biopsies from foreign countries? Um, I do not have a clue about the cost, but uh, you can always get in touch with Tambre and the, the, patient, uh, the patient care team. Mm -hmm. Can we accept transported trophectoderm biopsies from foreign countries? Uh, we can accept um, um, human samples and tea from tissues and cells coming from abroad. That's quite easy within the European Union. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether our lab would take uh, a trophoctoderm biopsy coming from, uh, from abroad, from a different lab. And I don't think even that, I do not even think that that would be interesting for you. It's very delicate. Um, if the material, if the cells get degraded, 
they won't be able to have a diagnosis. We will have eventually, if they're able to process the sample, which they might not be, we can have a non-informative uh, result. So frankly, um, I don't think it is worth it. But if we wanted to have 100% accurate, accurate information on that, uh, we will need one of my colleagues from the, mm -hmm. the molecular biology lab. But I think pretty much what I've said is what, I, what it is. The samples are pretty delicate. We know that in 5% of the cases, the result is going to be non-informative, meaning that either we stay there or we can uh, uh, try to re-biopsy the embryo, which with everything that it implies, throwing, new sample, refreezing, etc. So my advice is to get the biopsy done and, and processed at the center in which uh, you did the treatment. Okay, that explains this again, I, I believe. So yeah, as an okay from, from Joseph here as well. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed. Might have been our final question. I don't see more questions. I don't see that anyone is typing. But of course, as I mentioned, if you wish to get some more details, some more answers, get in touch with uh, Clinica Tamre. If not, if there are no questions for today, we will finish at this. But I think already it was a really interesting session. Thank you so much, Dr. Yanessa, for joining us. It was great to have you. Um, anything else you wish to add, as always, before we, um... we finish? I'm very happy. I was here. I was I was very happy with all of the questions, and it is a very interesting PET and PETA definitely. And it's go it is going to most likely change how we approach treatments, but we just need some more evidence uh, behind. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, we have non-invasive uh, mm -hmm. uh, pre-implantation and genetic testing that is being done already. We still need some more. Uh, confirmation regarding its safety, its accuracy, etc. But uh, one of the next revolutions in in reproductive medicine is definitely going to be in how we do the biopsy, where how we get the sample, where we get the sample from, and uh, where we do when we do it. Definitely. Okay, good to hear. And so, of course, uh, it's already done at Clinica Tambra the non-invasive uh, PGTA as well. Um, not uh, not yet because it isn't approved yet as a standard okay. testing. Mm -hmm. So until we don't have the thumbs up from all the authorities uh, right. outside a um, research context, it cannot be yes. done. Of course, makes sense. Again, thank you so much. And as you can see, there's a comment from Joseph here for you as well. So thank you everyone for joining. It was uh, lovely to have you and I hope that it was for useful. I'm, I'm sure it was. Uh, remember, it has been recorded. So if you wish to rewatch re this, it's possible. It will be available on our website uh, tomorrow and also on our YouTube channel. I can only encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel that way you will know where when the uh, video is uploaded. Dr. Yanissa, thank you so much for joining once more. Thank you um, much. It was great to, to have you back here. And I also want to add that we are going to be back next Tuesday. We will talk about understanding uterine lining, if this is something that is also interesting for you. Join us. We have another doctor, Dr. Roxolana Semishin, who will be with us. And we will discuss this topic on the 22nd of July, 7 p.m. UK time. Thank you, everyone, once more. You. Enjoy your evening and uh, see you back here pretty much soon, Dr. Yanis, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a nice Thank summer. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Same to you. Bye. Bye.